I realized that if I wouldn't have been led by the Spirit, wouldn't have allowed God to bring me through these times of refining and trials, what he's done through Lisa's in my life right now would have destroyed me. I would have been full of pride. I would have been full of myself. I would have been doing things in my own strength because if you can get something accomplished in your own strength by manipulating, creating an Ishmael, then you'll keep doing it, keep doing it, and keep doing it, and keep doing it instead of allowing God to do it. You know, we've been talking over and over again about discovering your specific calling and that if you seek God diligently in faith, mm -hmm. what's God going to do? He's going to give you a glimpse. Yeah. Remember? A glimpse. Mm -hmm. I have, I, I was just looking in, in my file this morning of the glimpses that God gave me in 1981, 1984. Mm -hmm. Literally in 1981 and 84, I'm reading this morning things I'm doing today. Wow. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. And yet, if you would have said to me, God's going to raise you up and send you to the nations of the world by writing books, I would have laughed you out of the room because English was my worst subject. I couldn't even write a paper, let alone a chapter or a book. And yet, that's how God has raised you, us up. So often, the very path that we believe we're going to go on is not the path that we'll end up going on. Interesting. I remember, you know, when I was working for my church, I was so striving and striving and striving and striving. And I remember one day the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, you just thought of another way that I'm going to raise you up and send you to the nations. I said, yeah. He said, you just thought of another way. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> he said, and he told me that day, he said, you will not be able to figure out how I'm going to raise you up because this is a walk of faith, not a walk of sight. Wow. Awesome. See, God, God sees Joseph. He sees a young man that's going to obey him. And what does God do? He gives him a glimpse, gives him mm -hmm. two dreams mm -hmm. about leadership. Mm -hmm. Joseph had no idea that between that dream and the fulfillment of that dream was a pit, which pit stands for preachers in training, by the way. Um, it's an acronym for <laughs> people in training, I should say that, because we all go through those pits. Yeah. Then there'd be 10 years of slavery, and then there'd be two years of a dungeon, and it'd be so hopeless that you'd think you'd never get out of it. Uh, David has a prophet come, the, the senior prophet of the whole nation, you're the next king of Israel. David has no idea. I mean, he sees it all come to pass. He's like, oh, man, God is doing this just right. He gets asked to the palace to be a minstrel. And then he gets asked to be Saul's armor bearer, the king's armor bearer. Then he gets asked to come to the king's, son's ta or to the king's table to eat with his sons. Mm -hmm. Then he gets given the king's daughter for wife. David's like, come on. <laughs> He's just setting me up. He's going to hand that throne to me. The prophecy is going to be fulfilled. What David doesn't understand is there's going to be 14 years right. of a hell week. Yeah. You know, living in deserts, living in wildernesses, having to go to the Philistines in exile, can't see his family, can't, you know, see the people he grew up with, can't enjoy the customs of his nation that he's growing up with, all because of his boss that God puts him under. But yet, that was the, the road traveled for him to have the character to be a good shepherd yeah. Yeah. in Israel. If you look at John the Baptist... God announces his calling to his dad before he's even born. He's still in his mama's womb. But he's in the wilderness 30 years training for a six-month ministry. Can you imagine that? Training 30 years for a six-month ministry. Remember, he's six months older than Jesus. And when Jesus comes along, he says, I must decrease that he may increase. Six-month ministry. You look at Moses. Moses knows when he's 40 years old, I'm the one that's going to deliver this nation. Yet it wasn't for 40 more years. He's on the backside of the desert. Why does yeah. God do this? That's what we're talking about. Well, I want to read something from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. I think I'll put it up on the board. So, be truly glad. All right, is that established? Glad, okay? There is wonderful joy ahead. Now remember, the fulfillment of anything God promises to you for your calling is joy. There's joy wrapped up in that package. Okay, so if I like wrap up a gift and you open it up, involved in that gift is joy. Right. Fulfilling your calling, there's joy. Remember, go back to lesson number two, all right? There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many, now I want you to underscore that word many, many trials for a little while. Now, a little while to God can be two, three, four, five, six years. Remember, a day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. So what that means is basically 
40 years is what? An hour? Okay, so a little while to God, 15 minutes can be six, seven years. All right, for a little while, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being, what is being, your faith is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. So your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, again, emphasis on many, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. This is the aspect of fulfilling your calling that you have to talk about, and that is the many trials. The many trials strengthen your faith, build your character, so that you can handle that position that God is calling you to. And I remember when, let, let's go back to my time in, in, in the church when I was driving the van. So before I became the youth pastor, we're going back into that time. I remember that um, the pastor and his wife, my job for four years, or actually, excuse me, three and a half years was to take care of their personal, you know, responsibilities, their children at school, giving their kids swimming lessons. I was picking up the guest speakers. That's how I was picking up T.L. Osborne. Well, they, they liked the job that I did so much that their executive assistant position came open, which was more of an administrative role, a secretary role. And they said, oh, man, we're going to put John in that role. We're losing our existing person. We want him to be in that role. So they moved me into that role, and I did a horrible job. It just wasn't, I just didn't have the gift set to be a good administrative assistant. I'm just not a secretary, okay? <laughs> and so I remember the final straw that broke the camel's back is when my pastor had a, big television, you know, appearance that he was supposed to do, and I forgot to tell him about it, and he missed it, and he said, hey, John, what was I supposed to be doing an hour ago, and I went, oh, no, <laughs> so what happened was they loved, they loved Lisa and I so much, and they loved me, they realized, hey, we put him, we, we positioned him to fail, we put him in a bad position, well, my job of picking up the guest speakers was already taken, I raised up another man to take that job, so they're like, gosh, we don't, we got to find somewhere to put John, so they, so they put me in this position that was, I reported to a woman who reported to a man who reported to the pastor. So I went down three levels, okay? I, I, I reported directly to the pastor. My office, there were three offices in the executive office, mine, his, and hers. Wow. And now I'm way in another part of the building working for a woman who works for a man who works for them. And that man wasn't even in their area. So... I, I was in pain. I was in pain. And um, I remember in this time period, I was really, really on edge. I was yelling at my wife, yelling at my baby, whose name is Addison, who was only nine months old at the time. I'm mad at my friends. I'm yelling at them. I'm just like yelling at everybody. I'm mad at everybody. I'm mad at everything. Everything's just going wrong. And I had never been this way. It's the first time in my whole life I'd ever been so angry and got angry so easy, and so one day I was out praying, and I said, God, where is all this anger coming from? What do I bind and cast out of my life? And that's when I learned that you can't cast out flesh. You have to crucify it. Mm -hmm. And the Lord spoke to me that morning, and I'll never forget. He said, son, he said, look at, look at your wedding ring on your finger. And I looked at my wedding ring, and he had brought this scripture to my attention. And, and, and you know, I... I I looked at my wedding ring, and it was a different ring. Lisa gave this to me later, but it was a gold ring. And he said, does that look like pure gold to you? And I said, yes, it does. He said, is it pure gold? And I said, no, it's not. I said, it's 14 karat gold. Now, 14 karat means 14 parts out of 24 parts is gold. 10 parts out of 24 parts is impurities, copper, zinc, nickel. He said, it looks like pure gold, though, doesn't it? I said, yeah, it looks like pure gold. He said, if, I put it, he said, if you put that ring in a furnace and you heat up the furnace to 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit, what happens? I said, well, the gold liquefies. He said, then what happens? I said, well, then all the impurities would come to the surface. And the Lord said, they appear, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, they appear. He said, they were in there the whole time, right? I said, yeah, they were in there the whole time. He said, you keep saying, where is this, all this anger coming from? Why, why do I keep getting angry so easy? Why am I offended with everybody? He said, these are impurities that have been in there. And he said, I've brought you into my furnace of affliction, Isaiah 48. And he said, this furnace is causing these, these, these substances to appear, these, the, this anger to appear. This, he said, now you can blame everybody. You can blame your wife, blame your pastor, blame your friends. And he said, if you do, the impurities will go right back down. 
He said, or you can say, God, this is my problem. Wow. And he said, yeah. what I'll do is he said, I'll take my big ladle and scoop off the impurities. Yeah, wow. And I realized right then that my faith, which is much more precious than gold, yeah. was being tested by fire. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. And I remember in this six month, it was actually an 18 month time period. At one point it got so bad. I, I was walking into the church offices and they were big. They, they had 450 employees at one point. And I remember one day I, I just, I couldn't, I, I, I got up in pain I went to bed in pain. I ate breakfast in pain. I ate lunch in pain. I ate dinner in pain. I mean, do you know when Jeremiah said, my pain is perpetual? Mm-hmm. I understand that. I lived in pain. Mm-hmm. I remember one day I closed the door of my office and I just put my head between the corner, the walls, right? <laughs> and I said, God, why do I hurt so bad inside? Wow. And God spoke to me. He said, because you're dying. And he said, there's always pain in death. And then he said this to me that day. He said, do you want to know how, how you're going to know when you're dead? I said, how do I know when I'm dead? He said, when you don't hurt anymore. He said, dead people don't hurt. Wow. I said, God, would you please kill me quick? <laughs> but these, these were the trials that I went through. But then, remember I, I said I went to become youth pastor, right? Yeah. Well, now I'm a youth pastor. And everything's great for six months, just like the other times. Oh, I'm loving it. We, we got a... We got a, a, a a youth television program. The church had never had it before, but God had put it in my heart. We raised the funds with the youth, not the parents of the youth. The youth gave to it. We had 10 o'clock every Saturday night on a station that reached 4 million people in Central Florida. Man, everything's rocking, 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 right? But I remember there was a young man in my youth group, and his dad was my boss. He was the executive administrative pastor of the church. And I'm preaching on holiness and dying to yourself and preaching these messages, right? Well, he comes up to me one day and go, he's just crying. He just said, how can I live the life you're preaching? Well, my mom and dad do this at home and this at home and this at home. And he walked up to my wife and said that. And my wife went, oh, no, this is John's boss. Well, that man tried to destroy me. And for the next 18 months, this was another 18-month one. A little while can be 18 months. Seems like a forever when you're in it, though. I remember that man, he determined to destroy me. He drove a wedge between me and the pastor. I didn't meet with the pastor at one point for four months. Couldn't get to him because he, he had told the pastor lies about me that weren't true, told me lies about the pastor that I don't think were true, and he was just driving a wedge. And I remember I was spending hours praying every day. I mean hours, just to, just to keep a, a great attitude, right? Yeah. And I remember employees would walk up to my wife of the church and, and they'd go, why doesn't he just put your husband's name on this? Like he forbid praying in the, in the choir loft, which is where I went every lunch to pray because I was on a fast, like, God, what's going on? And uh, there were all kinds of things that he did, and he was just determined to destroy me. And finally, he, he did. He, he got me to the point where I was going to be fired on that Monday. It was a Friday. And I had the first meeting with the pastor in four months. And the pastor's two brothers said, John, you're going to be fired on Monday. You just need to brace yourself. And on Sunday morning, pastor got up and said, there's going to be a big change in the youth group. Uh, I need to meet with all the parents on Tuesday night. And I'm sitting there on the platform, and I know the brothers have told me, I'm fired. You know? And I remember walking into that pastor's office, and the pastor looked at me, and he was alone. He was supposed to be there with that guy, and they were going to fire me. And he said, God sent you here. You're not leaving. And I remember God delivered us in that very hour. And I remember that man, six months later, I was out of town. Everything he was doing got exposed, everything he was doing. He could have been prosecuted and put in jail for years. But the pastor had mercy on him, just followed it away at a lawyer's office. But these are some of the things that, you know, I went through. And what what I couldn't understand is I'm not being productive. I'm not being fruitful. Seems like, you know, yeah, you know, a lot of youth were getting ministered to in our youth meetings. But I was like... Why do I have to live like this with all this adversity and all this hardship and all this? I'm sure Paul must have thought that. You know, he's got these Jews that are following from city to city to city, trying to destroy him. But yet, he said, God, take it away from me. And God says, don't you realize my grace is sufficient for you? Because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. What I didn't understand is that God was developing character in me that was going to be able to handle the calling that he had placed on my life. I'm firmly convinced that when God called me back in the mid-80s, if God would have, or well, back in the early 80s, if God would have put me when I really believed I was ready, because I used to tell people, I'm ready. I mean, Jesus is coming in 1988. I've got to get out to the nations. I literally said that. And, 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 and I was ready in 1985, 86, and I was like, 
And, and I remember there was a lady named Marilyn. She was one of the guests in our church, and she just looked at me. She said, just go start your ministry. Just go down to the, to the, to the, to the, to the Caribbean like T.L. Osborne and Daisy Osborne do. And just start your ministry. I was like, yeah, that's what I need to do. And I realized that if I wouldn't have been led by the Spirit, wouldn't have allowed God to bring me through these times of refining and, and trials, what he's done through Lisa's in my life right now would have destroyed me. I would have been full of pride. I would have been full of myself. I would have been doing things in my own strength because if you can get something accomplished in your own strength by manipulating, creating an Ishmael, then you'll keep doing it, keep doing it, and keep doing it, and keep doing it instead of allowing God to do it. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, as people with callings on our life, do we want God to be doing this or us to be doing it? Let me tell you, um, when I was trying to birth my Ishmael, I was asked to go to the Philippines. This was right before I became the youth pastor. Okay, right at the very end. After TL, after I said no to TL, I was asked by another ministry to go to the Philippines. And I remember God gave me the money 45 minutes before the flight left. Wow. Wow. My wife, I made an agreement with her. The, the, the minister, it was a big organization. He said, I'll pay half your ticket to the Philippines. You pay the other half. You go over there and preach with my guy. And um, I remember... I said to my wife, I said, I'm putting it on the credit card, but back then, if you turned in the ticket, you got full credit. I said, I promise you I'll not get on that plane unless, unless God gives us the money. And so for one week, I'm just like, okay, God, okay, God. Everybody knows in my church I'm going, okay, are you going to do something? So I went to the wealthiest guy in our church. He was a guy who owned two jets, okay? And um, I said to him, I'm going on a missions trip. I'm going to the Philippines. Would you drive me to the airport? He said, oh, I'd love to. And uh, I remember the morning I was going on that trip to the Philippines. I opened up the door, and there's a Bible school student staying at my door. And I said, no, no, you're not supposed to take me. The other guy's taking me. He said, oh, he couldn't do it. <laughs> Last night he asked me to take you. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to go to the airport with this guy, and I'm going to have to get a cab home because I can't get on the plane. So we're driving to the airport, and he's talking to me all about his Bible school experiences, and I'm, I'm like, I'm not even there. I'm like going through it. And I remember we got to the airport and he said, let me come in with you. And I said, no, I don't want you to come in with me. He said, come on, let me come in with you. I said, okay, he's just going to watch me get in a cab and go home. <clears throat> so he comes in, he puts my bag down, the Bible school student. He said, you know, last Wednesday night I was in bed and I knew about your trip. He said, God kept me up half the night saying that I needed to pay for half your ticket wow. because you didn't have $1,000 and you needed $1,000. I said, okay. He said, I finally got to sleep that night by saying, God, if you arrange a miraculous way for me to hand it to him, I'll do it. He said, when that guy asked me to take you last night, I about fell out of my bed. He said, I'm here to tell you you have your $1,000 get on the plane. I, I literally called Lisa for, can you believe it? <laughs> so I'm on this plane to the Philippines, right? And I'm just reading. I'm reading the Bible. And, and, and the Bible says there was a man sent by God, whose name was John. That was John the Baptist. And the sent by God jumped up off the page. And the Holy Spirit said to me, do you want to be sent by John Bevere or do you want to be sent by God? Wow. And I said, I want to be sent by God. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what the Holy Spirit said to me? He said, good. He said, because if you send you, you'll go in your authority. Yeah. He said, but if I send you, you'll go in my authority. Now, do you know what I started noticing all throughout the, the, the Gospels in the book of Acts after that? I noticed that, what are the statements they said about John the Baptist? He speaks as one with authority. He doesn't speak like yes. the scribes and the Pharisees. Wow. Well, now, wait a minute. Here's John. His dad's a priest. Mm -hmm. He's supposed to go to school with Gamaliel and learned under the greatest teacher, Bible teacher of their day mm -hmm. in Jerusalem. All of his friends are going to Gamaliel's school, mm -hmm. and God says, go to the desert. And John's like, no, 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 you mean I'm supposed to go study under Camellia? Desert. No, 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 all my friends, they're going to get diplomas. They're going to get their, their, their doctorates. They're going to they're become pastors of churches. Desert. Mm -hmm. And he goes to the desert. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says, I love this, it says, it says Caiaphas was high priest and Annas were high priest and all these priests were doing their thing. And the word of the Lord came to John in the desert. Wow. And he spoke as one with authority. And that's what Jesus meant. What did you go out there to the desert for? What did you go out there for? Hmm. To see a reed chicken in the wind? To see somebody dressed up in nice clothes? They're in the king's palaces. He said, you went out there to hear a prophet, a man with the word of the Lord, a man who speaks under authority. Okay. Hmm. 
And what happened was God said, you let me send you, you go on my yeah. authority. So now think about this in the business world. Mm -hmm. Think about this in education. Mm -hmm. Think about this in military. Think about this in athletics. Mm -hmm. What happened to my friend named Aaron? He listened to God. Right. And now he's prospered in the realm of the PGA. He's impacted so many more people. When he won his first tournament, he won it on Easter Sunday, and he did a sunrise service with 2,000 people at the event, and they talked about it on international TV. They wrote about it in the Sydney newspaper. I was in Sydney when he won it, and I'm like, look at the impact. He's now operating in God's authority yeah. in the PGA. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if you're in ministry. I'm telling you my stories because, hey, this is, this is my realm. Mm -hmm. God's called me to the ministry. Mm -hmm. But if you're called to military, you're called to the science, you're called to education, you're called to raise children, whatever it is, if you're doing what God tells you. Let me tell you, the enemy is going to try to get you to birth in Ishmael. Mm -hmm. He's going to do everything he can, everything he can yeah. to get you out of the place God puts you. Yeah. He's going to get you to try to launch yourself early because he doesn't want you going in God's authority. Mm -hmm. And so that's the real key. Man, I'll tell you, this is lesson nine. Yeah. And if there's one that I can't overemphasize, it's this one. Because you know how many people I see that are in ministry because they're in ministry, because they know they're called to ministry, but they don't have authority. They, they're not doing near what God called them to do because they went out ahead of their time. They listened to the people that said, hey, go out and start a church. You've got a calling on your life. Just, just find a city and start a church. But yet they're not walking in that authority. Yeah. I want to see a generation rise up that they have the authority of God in them in the medical field, in, 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 in the marketplace, yeah. in education, in government, mm -hmm. in athletics. That's the Joshua generation yeah. that I really believe is coming. The many that are chosen, not the few. Yeah, when you look at it from the cross, the resurrection till the second coming of Jesus, yes, few will fulfill what God has called them to do. But I believe that generation, that final generation before he comes, they're going to be like Joshua's generation. Mm -hmm. And I believe many are going to be chosen in that generation. I believe you guys are part of that generation. Mm -hmm. In the last lesson, it's the next one. It's really the exciting one, okay? Here's the question we're going to address. How do I maximize my calling? Awesome. Yeah. Boy, this one's going to be good. I can hardly wait to get to it. Yeah.